Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our data submission office hours call. I'll start by introducing our panelists for today's session. My name is Rebecca Licky. I am our National Outpatient Programs Consultant here at AHA. I'm joined by my wonderful colleague, Liz Montgomery, Program Operations Man Manager, Allison Smith, our Target VP Program Director, and Sarah O'Kane, Senior Product Development Manager. Before we get started, I wanted to review a few housekeeping items. First, please know that the meeting is recorded and slides will be available after the presentation. We recommend that you ask questions live in the Q&A feature of Zoom and keep an eye on the chat for messages from the AHA slash AMA team. We should have plenty of opportunities to answer these questions live during the call, but please know we will have additional office hours through the data submission cycle to answer any and all questions and are also always available via contact us form and help desk. Additionally, we do have captioning and a transcript available, but you can turn that feature off if it's distracting using the hide subtitle option or resize the captions to make them easier to read under subtitle settings. All right, so our agenda for today's call will begin with an opportunity for to identify which topic you have the most questions on, followed by an overview of the data submission process with timelines and resources. We'll pause for an open Q&A, followed by some answers to common FAQs we receive, and end with some additional time for questions if needed. All right, so we'll start off here with a poll. Um, we were curious, which category do you have the most questions on? Um, is it our technical data submission questions, user account registration, things like that, uh, measure specifications, timeline for submission and awards, the attestation questions for target BP, um, for track change control cholesterol, or for target type 2 diabetes? We'll leave this up for just a couple more seconds. I see some results coming in here. Got some, a couple of them are almost tied. We'll leave just a few more seconds. Okay. So it looks like we have the most responses about measure specifications followed by attestation questions for target VP. So wonderful. And with that, I believe I will pass it to Liz. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Um, we'll get started with a quick refresher on some key data submission reminders. They'll fall into that first category of the poll, and I, I did see a few, um, a few people select that. So we'll we'll touch on that first. So looking at our timeline right now, we are in the data submission phase where you can enter and revise your 2023 data in our online data platform. The deadline for data entry is Friday, May 17th at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time. Please note that the um, time zone is Eastern Time as it might not be the same as where you're located. And data will be captured at exactly midnight Eastern Time, one minute after the deadline. And that will determine the award status for all sites. So it's very important to get all data completed before that deadline. Next, the AHA and the AMA will be reviewing and validating the data submitted to classify awardees by award level. You might hear from either our national or local team during this time, most likely around June, and we'll reach out to you if we have any questions about your submission and your response will help us to confirm your appropriate award level. So please keep an eye out for an email from us um, between June and August as well. During the fall, we'll then notify 2024 awardees with your congratulations email and toolkit, and we'll celebrate your accomplishments on our program websites. The recognition does not end at that phase. We'll continue to uh, promote them with additional highlights of awardees at scientific sessions and in a published national ad. Keep in mind, there are two steps to submit data for award achievement. 
The first step is to register. This lets us create a profile and user login for you in our online data platform. If your organization is new to submitting data, you can go to heart.org slash register my outpatient org to register. If you have submitted data before and you already have a profile, you don't need to worry about re-registering. You can skip straight to um, step two, entering data. But if you are registering, um, you can keep in mind, we're gonna be asking you for some basic demographic questions and importantly, what initiatives you wish to register for. You can register for all three at the same time. And if you're considering, um, if you're considering participating in any three, I encourage you to select all of them. If, because if you do want to add additional programs later, you'll need to come back and complete the form again. So starting with all three will save you time in the long run. We'd like you to note that one registration will equate to one potential award. If you want your health system and each of its individual locations to all be listed individually and each receive a certificate, you will need to submit registration forms for each. But if you want to register five or more sites at the same time, there is a multi-site submission process. Um, it's in that same registration link and it'll just save you um, a little bit of time as you can register for them all in one swoop. The second step, um, now that you would have access to the data platform, is to start by logging in to that platform and then navigating to the Program Forms tab. You'll hit Add New, enter 2023 because you are entering data from calendar year 2023. You'll fill in all the fields, check the Data Entry Complete checkbox, and then click Save and Exit. You can save and return to revise your data really up until that May 17th deadline. Um, I know this is a really quick simplified walkthrough and we'll share where you can find a very detailed walkthrough on entering data here in a little bit. Now let's go ahead and walk through some of the basic award criteria like measure specifications that we run into common questions on. First, who is eligible for an award? We have a pretty broad range of outpatient organizations that participate, but the fundamental criteria is that your healthcare organization as registered and as submitting data must directly diagnose and manage patients with these chronic disease conditions. This means your organization must be prescribing and managing the medications of patients who have these conditions. It also means that if you're primarily a screen and refer organization, um, you would not be eligible for an award. Our quality improvement tools and resources, though, remain freely available to all, and we certainly encourage sharing them with all health care organizations. Some of the data that we ask will be identical across program forms, and it can be copied and pasted from one form to another. Target BP, check change control cholesterol, and target type 2 diabetes will all ask for your total adult patient population. That's going to be question three in each form. We'll ask for a breakdown of that total population by race and ethnicity, and a breakdown of that total population by the patient's primary payer. And we'll also ask for your total number of providers. On the race and ethnicity table, we use a simplified version of the categories taken from Table 3B of the HRSA UDS reporting requirements for 2023 health center data. We do ask that this is narrowed down to your total adult patient population that is given in that question three total. And this year we have one adjustment to the table um, following UDS as Hispanic or Latinx was changed to Hispanic, Latino, Latina, or Spanish origin. And now to get into further initiative specific details, I'm going to go ahead and pass it to Allison Smith. Thanks, Liz, for summarizing some of the data requirements that are common to all the programs. I'm going to dig into target BP specifically, and then we'll talk about uh, check change control and, and target type diabetes in just a moment. So for target BP, um, the main uh, data 
submission requirements are outlined here at a high level. Um, but just to summarize, we use MIPS 236, the controlling high blood pressure measure, um, and its specifications, uh, which include inc yeah, have inclusion and exclusion criteria described in them. But the, the denominator for this measure is the number of patients, um, adult patients who are 18 to 85 years of age, who had a visit during calendar year 2023 and had a diagnosis of uh, essential hypertension either before 2023 or during the first six months of 2023. Um, the numerator for this measure is of those patients, um, do they have their blood pressure uh, controlled to a level that is less than 140 uh, over 90? So this table on the slide illustrates a few examples of whether or not a particular patient might be included or excluded in the denominator and then therefore the numerator um, of this measure. And so for example, if a patient had a visit in March of 2023 and they were first diagnosed with essential hypertension in March of 2023, they would be included. Um, in the next example, let's say a patient had a, their first visit um, in October of 2023, and that was the first time they were diagnosed uh, with hypertension. They would not be included, even though they had a visit during calendar year 2023, the diagnosis didn't occur until the latter half of the year, so they would be excluded. And then in the last example, uh, a patient who again had a, a visit in the latter half of 2023 in October, but their diagnosis was made the year prior, for example, in November of 2022, that patient would be included um, in this measure. So that's a high level description, again, of the, um, the metric for controlling high blood pressure. There are detailed specifications of other conditions for which patients are excluded, such as pregnancy, uh, frailty uh, in hospice care, things like that, um, that you should uh, certainly uh, attend to when you're doing your calculations, if your system doesn't that, do that automatically for you. In terms of uh, the attestation questions, uh, we will be asking um, six attestation questions for each of the evidence-based pillars. And we'll talk about those in a minute, but the answer options are yes, no, or not sure. Um, and the, uh, the also the attestation questions, as I said, um, you know, it will span, there's some new pillars. So on the next slide, um, we have uh, the existing uh, questions for which you may be familiar from years past around measure accurately. And these are high level descriptions of those questions, but essentially asking you during 2023, did you calibrate your blood pressure devices per guideline recommendations? Did you check to see if they're validated? Did you train and test your team during 2023 um, in blood pressure measurement? Uh, have you adapt, adopted protocols for confirmatory measurements, either through uh, repeat in-office measurement, use of um, ambulatory uh, blood pressure, 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring or self-measured blood pressure? And do you do use some type of a job aid or post an infographic where blood pressure is measured in your clinic setting? So by attesting to each of these questions, um, you will be considered for award status if you can attest to at least four out of six of those for the year of 2023. And those answers would make you eligible for the silver or the gold plus status. Um, so with that, I'll just move to the next uh, slide, which is looking at the expanded question, these new questions in the realms of act rapidly, partner with patients, SMBP, and equitable health outcomes. There are six questions in each of these new pillars. However, these are in a dry run this year. They will not count towards your award status, um, but they are, it's a really great opportunity to establish a baseline assessment of your practice. And it also is data that will be very valuable to us to inform how we create resources to help your, you achieve them um, in the years to come. So they, these answers will count toward your award status in 2025. So again, you have the option of yes, no, or unsure. Uh, we hope that you'll make every effort to answer them as accurately as you can to the best of your ability. Um, and again, to establish a baseline and help inform how we can help you um, be successful in that regard. So with that, I will turn to Sarah, who's going to talk about check change control specific data submission requirements. Thanks. Thank you, Allison. Um, so going over the measure criteria for check change control cholesterol, um, 
we are using MIPS 438, which is statin therapy for prevention and treatment of cardiovascular disease. And um, I will also note for all of these measures, they have a CMS ECQM equivalent. So these are all the CMS measures. And this is just basically like the MIPS version ID, but there is an ECQM ID as well. Um, and we can put those in the chat after this, um, just so that you you know, like what are the, the identical measure IDs to use. Um, but for the statin therapy measure, the denominator of this measure is the total number of patients who are meeting any of three risk group criteria. Um, and there is a note that there's been some kind of minor wording adjustments to the risk groups since 2023. And really those are focused more along just kind of like they they tweak some of the words, but the spirit of the measure is really the same. So the the three risk groups are all patients with an active diagnosis of clinical ASCVD or whoever had an ASCVD procedure um, <clears throat> or patients 20 years and up who have ever had a, an LDLC level greater than or equal to 190 milligram, milligrams per deciliter or were previously diagnosed with or have an active diagnosis of familial hypercholesterolemia. Or the third risk group is patients age 40 to 75 years old with a diagnosis of type 1 or type 2 diabetes. So most of that is identical to last year's criteria. They really only tweak some of the wording around like having an active diagnosis of clinical ASCVD or ever having an ASCVD procedure. Um, but the spirit is pretty much the same. And then the numerator of that, so that that's basically patients who meet any of those criteria. It's a lot of criteria, but they're they're considered like all the patients who are at risk for um, an ASCVD event. So of all those patients, looking at the total number who are actively using or who receive an order for statins at any point in the measurement year, which for this year, it will be 2023. And then in addition to the measure submission questions. Um, there's a couple of extra questions just for you to attest to around your use of um, the ASCVD risk score within your organization. If it's something that you capture at all, how you calculate it, if so, um, how it's documented in the EHR, if at all, and then if you have any specific treatment plans around managing high-risk patients. <clears throat> and then... Um, for target type two diabetes, um, we have uh, we we use MIPS number one, which is HbA one c poor control, and again we'll send the CMS ECQM ID in the chat in just a moment. Um, but this is, this measure has remained pretty much stable for a few years. We're looking in the denominator at number of adult patients, eighteen to seventy five years of age, who had a twenty twenty three visit and have a diagnosis of diabetes. And that's not necessarily just type two diabetes, it's, it's just general, any any diabetes, um, just because we're, even though the program is focused on type two diabetes, the national measure encompasses all diabetes. Um, and then the numerator is a little unique on this one, so you'll just have to be careful when you're pulling your queries or looking at your percentages. <clears throat> the We're looking at the total number of those patients with diabetes whose most recent HbA1c level in 2023 is greater than 9%, which means they're they're not, you know, they're out of control basically like they're they're um going in the the direction that we don't want um or they had a visit in 2023 but didn't have any hemoglobin levels checked in 2023. So this is looking at or outcomes, it's not looking at patients who are meeting positive outcomes. So if you end up with like a really high percentage, then you may want to double check that the whomever has done the query didn't flip the like that nine percent um, the greater than sign. And then target type two diabetes also requires submission of either the other two measures for our other two uh, initiatives. So either controlling high blood pressure or the statin therapy measure. Um, there's no change to the data you're submitting. You're just submitting identical data. Um, and then the those criteria are used to determine your achievement award threshold. So you do have to submit at least one of those, uh, preferably the one where you are performing higher. Um, and then for, for 
type 2 diabetes, we also have some clinical practice questions around treatment plans, uh, guideline-based pharmacologic therapy, um, and then around kidney health assessment. And then this slide here is really just re-emphasizing that um, when you're picking that second measure for uh, that's not the hemoglobin A1C measure, um, <clears throat> you can use either the statin therapy or the controlling high BP measure, but you're just going to grab the identical numerator and denominator you submitted for the other programs if you're participating. Um, so you don't need to narrow the population to those with diabetes or do any other adjustments. And then with that, I will pass it back to Liz for resources. Thank you. All right. So uh, we did want to just touch on where you can find answers to more detailed questions uh, before diving into your questions, because this might be um, a good uh, a, a good knowledge to have when we go, go there for where you can find more details. So first, if you're looking for more technical support on navigating the data platform and submission process, then we have different formats for different learning styles. We have a PDF quick user guide that provides step-by-step -step instructions for each of the program forms. We also have a navigating the data platform video, um, and that's a great introduction to the functionality of the platform for a new user. And then we also have tutorial videos on how to submit data for each program form specifically. So there's a quick version that's just an overview, helps you get oriented. And then we also have a full walkthrough. Um, it's, a, it's a deep dive that goes over every single step in the program form. And um, that includes um, examples of some common errors that you might, um, you might come across. On a different note, if you're looking for more supporting resources on answering the questions themselves, we do have um, an additional set of resources. So we have our data collection worksheets and that includes the exact questions you'll be asked in the platform and additional context on many of those questions. I know uh, Sarah's planning on dropping the ECQMs into the chat, they're also included. Um, on each of the data collection worksheets, you can see different uh, equivalent measures um, at the top of each of those worksheets. Our FAQ documents go into even greater detail for common questions um, on a wide, wide variety uh, of topics that come up during the data submission piece. And then finally, we include attestation questions that are asking you about your clinical practices and recognize that they may require some more nuances and examples. So we have additional documents for both target BP and target type two diabetes that not only give more context into the questions, but they also provide the guideline criteria that help to lead to their inclusion in the program forms and specific resources that can help you work to achieve or improve upon the criteria of those attestation questions. I also want to call out one additional resource that we have available. So if you're submitting data for multiple sites, we do have an option that allows you to um, put those all together into one CSV file and upload all of that data at one time. If you're only submitting data for a couple of sites, we find that it's still easiest to go through the program form, which is the method that's included in um, that user guide and in those demo videos. But if you have, say, 10, 20, 60 sites that you're submitting data for, we find that this uploader tool will save you a lot of time in, um, in the end. So if you're interested in pursuing this option, work with your um, local AHA representative, and they can provide you with templates, detailed instructions, um, additional demo videos. If you aren't yet in touch with a local director, but you still want to pursue this option, feel free um, to reach out to our contact us form and we would be happy to connect you. And I hope some questions are starting to come in. I, I see a little red bubble on the Q&A as uh, we're gonna be opening the floor for that in just a moment. But before we do so, I'd like to share a few tips for success. One, we encourage you to register new organizations early as it can take up to three business days to process your registration. Two, we recommend 
entering and saving your data as early as possible. And this will allow our staff time to both confirm that your submission came through and is fully complete. It will also allow them to provide you more support in troubleshooting any questions or issues that might come up along the way. And then three, we shared a lot of resources today in just a couple of slides and, and in the chat, but I recommend that the data collection worksheets and the quick user guide will be your best go to resources. Last, if you make sure that that data entry complete checkbox is selected and you're able to save, that will ensure that you have completed everything that you need to on that form. And of course, the, the biggest tip for success is just to stay in contact with our team. We are here to offer support and answer your questions along the way. A reminder of a few key takeaways. So the deadline to submit data for an achievement award is May 17th. If you submitted data before, you do not need to re-register unless you would like to add a new initiative access to your organization. And as you submit your answers to the new Target BP pillar questions, please know that they're not going to affect your awards this year, but they are going to help us tremendously with establishing a baseline for future recognition and future awards. And with that, I'll uh, pass it back to Rebecca to see if we have any questions for an open Q&A. Sure. So, um... Sarah, actually, um, I know that there was a question asked in the um, Q&A, but I was hoping you might be able to answer that live because I think um, others might also have the same question. Um, so one of our participants had asked, uh, why is MIPS measure being considered and not UDS measures? Yes, I'm happy to answer that. And um, <clears throat> I think it might just be a, a naming convention um, difference because in the UDS manual, it asks for the measures by their CMS ECQM ID, um, but they are the same measures as the MIPS measures. So um, I put in the chat, and then like Liz mentioned on all the data collection worksheets, the equivalent IDs are mentioned. So for example, the controlling high blood pressure measure is MIPS number 236, but the electronic measure version that UDS references is called CMS 165 version 11. Um, but for all intents and purposes, they are the same measure and you are welcome to use either specification, especially if the ECQM version is already built into your platform um, and readily available. It's more just that the MIPS version has like the full paper PDF that provides full instructions for organizations who may have to manually calculate the measure. So um, that's why we we default to that ID reference. Thank you, Sarah. That was very helpful. Um, we also, I think this question might be for you. Um, somebody had asked, do you allow fructosamine levels for patients who have a medical condition that would make the A1C unreliable? This is a good question. Um, and I may have to come back to you because I think... Um, or maybe get some more information because I think for this measure, it doesn't allow for fructosamine levels for the numerator. However, um, the patient might fall under exclusion criteria if they have a medical condition that, you know, like they'd, there's a, they call it advanced illness, but it's really a, a bunch of different conditions that are considered advanced illness. And so it's very possible that this patient might fall under that category and be excluded from the measure. Um, so you don't get dinged unnecessarily for not having an A1C when they really wouldn't need one. Um, but happy to to talk to you offline to get more information about met those medical conditions. Thank you, Sarah. Um, okay, the next question I believe would be for Liz. Um, so we had an attendee ask, we may not have demographic data yet from 2023, for example, patient population, race, ethnicity, breakdown, et cetera, and probably won't before data submission deadline. Can I submit 2022 data or what is your recommendation? So for award achievement, we do require it to be 2023 data. This is an annual process and we always look at the year prior for um, award achievement. 
if it is um if it is a matter of like you're able to pull all of the me measure data and you're able to do all of the attestation data and look at all of those practices um, from 2023 and the issue is um, specifically with pulling payer information and specifically with race and ethnicity information, it might be worth reaching out to your lake, local AHA contact and we can work with you to see if there's, um, you know, a different route to collect that data or um, submit uh, using the unknown fields in a way that would work for you, but we would still need to make sure to be able to get at least that total adult patient population and the measure numerator, denominator, and attestation questions for that calendar year. Um, I'll add that from like a benchmarking perspective, our data platform um, does allow retroactive data submission. So if you wanted to go ahead um, and utilize the platform and submit previous years to help uh, fill out the benchmarking reports that allow you to track year over year data. That is an option, but it would not qualify you for a 2024 award. Hope that helps. Yeah, thank you, Liz. That was very helpful. Um, those are the only questions we have at this time. Um, I welcome anybody who has additional questions to um, you know, pop into the Q&A or the chat and we can ask them during our next break. Okay, great. Um, we do have some questions that we frequently get, so we pulled them together and we can walk through these um, common questions in the meantime. I think, Sarah, you are going to kick off this section. Yes, this is me. Um, so just some technical FAQs. Um, if your organization's name has changed, how do you ensure that that new name is reflected for your achievement award? And the answer for that is to please reach out to us at the bit Lee AQ contact us link because um, that basically just tells our internal staff that <clears throat> we need to update your name on all of our internal documents um, around how you want your name to be published for award purposes. Um, but we will also put the caveat that if the name change is as a result of a major legal change, like a merger, an acquisition, um, you know, like you're you've been acquired by someone and now you're you've you're taking on the name of this whole new entity um then we might ask you to re-register the organization just to ensure that we we have the registration legal agreements and the data use agreement with the the correct entity and um and has the an updated name another question is We've been participating in Target BP, but we would like to submit cholesterol and or type 2 diabetes data this year as well. And how would we go about doing that? So the answer for this is going to the registration link. Um, that heart.org slash register my outpatient org will allow you to register your organization for one or multiple programs um, in one form. So you don't need to fill out separate forms. So you could register for both cholesterol and diabetes in the same form. Um, if you want to register multiple sites, so for example, like if you wanted to, if you have three different locations that you want to register for cholesterol and diabetes, um, you can fill out the form once per site, but you will have to then go and do another form for the next site and another form for the next site. Like basically the form is um, site specific. You can't add multiple sites within the form. Um, that said, there is also a link within the registration form for our multi-site registration process where you can fill out a spreadsheet and upload it instead, which is nice if you have a lot of sites, um, you know, usually like five or more, 10 or more, it, it just makes it faster. So you don't have to do the form five or 10 times. And the next slide, um, so if you are having trouble logging into the data platform, um, if you are a brand new user or like, so you just don't have a login at all, or you're replacing a prior staff member 
who has submitted data and they had their own login, then please contact us at the bit.ly link so that we can get you set up with a brand new login. If you're an existing user and you're basically locked out, you forgot your password, or you're having some other issue getting in, um, we recommend using the password reset options in the screen or contacting IT vendor at the email on the screen, or you can reach out to us for help if need be. Um, and then a note on that, just a, a little asterisk, is if your organization is brand new, you just submitted the registration form, um, please uh, be patient just because it it's a manual process on our end to process those registrations. So it may take up to three business days to receive your username and password. And then um, kind of shifting away from like login stuff and registration, um, a question around uh, the actual data submissions for the achievement awards for the payer questions where we ask for, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, um, uninsured, et cetera, and dividing the patients into each of those categories, um, looking for guidance around how to delineate each patient per category. There is, uh, in the, each of the data collection worksheets for each program, there is a um, nice little instruction section that details for each group, like Medicare, et cetera, um, which patients to count in there. Because some there are some instances where a patient might count in one or more categories. <clears throat> and for those, we try to lay out like which one to prioritize. So if they count in both, you pick this one. <clears throat> and then on the next slide, let me just double check that this one is for me as well. I think it is. Um, Yes. Uh, so if you do not capture race and ethnicity, which <clears throat> it sounds like we already kind of had a similar question around this in around, you know, capturing demographics, you can place those patients in the unknown grouping. Um, we would ask that before you apply like a, an average or something, like, for example, if you know, last year, 20% of your patients we're black or African American, and so this year you have 100,000 patients, so you're going to assume the 20% this year are also black or African American. Um, that's kind of, we consider that sort of a last resort. Um, we recommend attempting to identify someone within your organization who might have more up to date data if you can. Um, but if you can't, you know, you can use that unknown grouping to the best of your ability. Like you could lump everybody into the unknown group if need be. Um, just note that after data submission ends and we're determining achievement award status, we might just reach out to verify your data. And then um, as you're entering data around your patient totals, as well as the measure submission totals, <clears throat> let's say that your, your patient totals include patients who were just seen by a dentist or a behavioral health specialist, or they just had a hospital admission, but they never actually saw anybody in the outpatient space. Um, do you include those visits and those patients in the total patient population? And then same question for the measure denominator. Um, and for this one, we would say, try your very best to filter to just the patients who were seen by providers who are actively diagnosing and treating hypertension. Um, so patients, you know, who were seeing uh, a specialist or a primary care provider or internal medicine, that kind of thing, where they have, they're able to follow up, <laughs> excuse me, um, they're able to follow up with their provider, um, receive, you know, medication adjustment, et cetera. So if they just had like a dental visit, that's not really a patient we would consider in this population. And if you can, we would ask you to exclude those patients from any of the day submission fields. And that goes for all of the initiatives. And now I will pass it over to Allison. Thanks, Sarah. I remember in the poll that many of you had questions about the attestation questions as a part of the data submission. So I'm gonna run through a few frequently asked uh, questions that uh, hopefully will help. Um, and I will also note that there is a great document that targeted BP evidence-based BP activities resources and example document 
that um, has been updated with the new attestation criteria and has a lot of examples of what would count or what might not count um, to help you think through the intent. Um, we try to anticipate the range of practices out there, but we certainly um, don't know all of the thing, different things that, that you all do across the country, but hopefully that additional guidance will be helpful. So here's one example. Each of the pillar questions in the new and the new questions ask about whether or not you are um, assessing to see if your standard of care is being followed. So for example, if you have a treatment algorithm, are you checking to see if it's used? If you have a policy and procedure um, about uh, assessing social determinants of health, for example, are you checking to see if it's being followed? Um, and these are examples of how you might um, determine whether the activity you're performing meets or doesn't meet the intent of that standard. So for example, if you're using your electronic health record or population health tool to pull reports that reflect some element uh, that, that where documentation reflects adherence to your uh, policy, for example, that is a perfectly appropriate way um, to assess your performance. Um, similarly, if you don't have that capability in your um, information systems, perhaps pulling a sample um, and doing a manual chart review as an example and looking at the team members who are responsible to perform that type of care and seeing if they are uh, performing that care is an exa another example of something that would meet that criteria. On the next slide, we have another commonly asked question. There was some confusion around the differences between 140 over 90, 130 over 80, and um, it really um, there's sort of three distinct concepts reflected here. I know the slide is a little bit busy, but if you're talking about the diagnosis of hypertension, we're really referring to the thresholds that are defined in the 2017 ACC AHA hypertension guidelines. That rainbow chart is a commonly uh, way we, that we refer to that. And these are, again, the, the thresholds that we use to diagnose individuals with hypertension. We also see in the in the guidelines treatment goals, and this is reflected in the center column. And the recommendation in the 2017 ACCHA guideline is to um, provide treatment for patients who uh, to get them to a goal of less than 130 over 80 if they have been confirmed with a diagnosis of hypertension and known cardiovascular disease or a 10-year ASCVD event risk of 10% or higher. Um, so that's when you're treating an individual patient, and that is referred to in the new attestation questions as part of your treatment algorithm. One of the attestation questions specifically asks if this treatment goal is stated in your algorithm. The last is something that we've been talking about for many years now, and that's the performance measures. And so the NCQA, uh, the National Committee on Quality Assurance, is the ma national measure, measure steward who defines um, the requirements for this performance measure that we use, we've always used in target BP for annual award achievement of, the, and the performance measure defines patients who have blood pressure at a level of less than 140 over 90. And so those are, you know, the national measure specifications that we were discussing earlier um, today. And so that's where maybe some of the confusion has come over what numbers are we talking about and, and how do they apply to, um, how do they apply to data submission? So on the next slide, um, just to summarize here, it's the one for less than 140 over 90 that's used in the performance measure and is and that's the threshold that's used to determine gold and gold plus award achievement um, and where you'll be submitting a numerator and denominator. The place where you'll see less than 130 over 80 referenced again is is the threshold um, for treatment for initiating treatment for patients um, or excuse me for uh, a treatment goal for adults with confirmed hypertension. Um, and that you will see in the attestation questions in the context of using a treatment algorithm. So hopefully that helps clarify some of the confusion around um, those different numbers that we're seeing cropping up. On the next slide, uh, another common question from one of the other pillars, the partnering with patient pillars, which has to do with the assessment of modifiable lifestyle risk factors is what, what do you mean by intervention? So we're, we're assessing a patient for these risk factors, but then what it, we're also seeing if patients, um, that you are intervening to address them. And so that might be, there are a variety of ways you can intervene. It could be providing handouts and educational materials. It could be through goal setting and engaging patients in collaborative communications uh, to set lifestyle 
improvement goals. It could be referring a patient to a dietitian uh, or a community resource for a, a cooking class or prescribing food or exercise or medications to support them with modifiable lifestyle risk factors, including diet, nutrition, uh, physical activity, uh, and use of tobacco or alcohol. So those are all examples of intervention, knowing there may be more, but those are, that is the spirit um, and the intent of this set of attestation questions. On the next slide, uh, there's a question that's come up a few times around self-measured blood pressure uh, and that new set of questions and pillar. One of the uh, criteria asks whether or not you have received readings from a patient who may be performing home blood pressure monitoring. And the means for that to happen, again, we tried to broad, recognize a broad uh, array of practices. That could be a patient bringing in a piece of paper uh, that they've been writing their, lot, their readings down on. It could be stored a reading stored in a device that a patient brings in um, and shows to you, or it could be uh, automatically transmitted through Bluetooth, Bluetooth technology and uploaded into EHR. So a whole range of manual to elegant electronic um, transmission are all uh, ways that blood pressure data can be uh, received to attest positively uh, to this uh, attestation question. Um, and then one other question that's come up is why we're asking for a minimum number of 30 patients or 10% of patients um, with hypertension uh, participating in an SMBP program. And really, we're trying to um, assess the degree to which this is a systematic practice in your organization. So if you're just doing it for one patient um, or two patients, it's um, you know not really the spirit of the pillar to adopt a practice systematically. Um, and then I think there's one more uh, slide about uh, the equ equitable health outcomes pillar. Um, this pillar assesses whether or not you're collecting race and ethnicity data or social determinant of health data, and then using those variables in your data to look at your blood pressure control rates and sort of stratify that data by variables that are important to the patient population that you serve. So there might be a particular group um, uh, with a primary language that you want to assess. Are their blood pressure control rates similar to um, other uh, patients who have a different, have English as their primary language or a particular community, a, a neighborhood, a zip code, uh, or patients without health insurance. And these are really tools to look for disparities in your health outcomes. And then obviously then uh, dig into opportunities to uh, achieve equitable health, health outcomes. What else does this patient population need from us to help improve their blood pressure control rate and make it comparable to that of our overall population? Um, and then for social determinants of health, you know, that is a sort of a broad term that could you could include things like uh, food, housing or transportation insecurity, uh, safety or mental health issues, um, immigration status, uh, being veterans, all of those types of social determinants um, might be variables that are relevant to your patient population to dig into and see if patients with those risk factors or circumstances have comparable outcomes to those who don't. Uh, so with that, I think we are moving on to just a few other um, FAQs, uh, turning back to uh, Liz, I believe. I think I think so. <laughs> um, before I jump into these, I do just want to um, call out, I know I saw a lot of questions on the target BP pillar as far as like part of that poll at the beginning. So if you do have questions and you want those answered, we're going to walk through our other programs, but please feel free to uh, put those in the Q&A and we're happy to jump to your live question um, and in the midst of all of these kind of common questions that we encounter. So first on this slide, um, in the meantime, is for our check change control cholesterol program, Sarah did talk about um, those different attestation questions that we're asking as part of the program. And on um, one of them, we're asking if you are calculating ASCVD risk. And if you don't calculate that, but you still want to submit your data, can you still be recognized? And the answer is yes. We're looking for organizations who are committed to continuously improving their assessment of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk, even if you aren't yet um, up to that level as an organization we want to work with you and we would like you to um, 
know that you are still eligible for recognition so long as you're submitting the measure data on statin therapy. And for target type 2 diabetes data, um, will my measure data entered for target BP or check change control cholesterol auto populate in the target type 2 diabetes form for those two measure options? And um, I know Sarah emphasized like how they are really identical measures across the different programs. And it would be awesome if we, they just auto populated once you filled them in one place. Unfortunately, we don't have that technology yet. So you will need to type them manually into both of the uh, program forms, but you can just easily toggle from one to the other. Just make sure that you are saving your work before you go back and forth because um, it doesn't save automatically. So, you know, copy from one program, save, go to the other program, paste, and you should be uh, good to go there. A couple more questions on target type 2 diabetes. Why, uh, and this is partially because we added these new questions last year, so we're actually going into our second year of asking some of these attestation questions that these two are on. And um, we were asked why we have this focus on GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT-2 inhibitors. And this is really because um, while the medications have been around for a while, recent national and international um, clinical trials and science has um, shown how they can be game changers in the treatment of type 2 diabetes and in reducing the risk of heart disease, stroke, um, heart failure, and chronic kidney disease um, among patients living with type 2 diabetes. So this is a, a, a big focus for us is to learn more about how organizations are prescribing and managing these medications. Um, and by by learning that we can see how we can better support organizations um, as well. Uh, for example, last year we learned about uh, from from the data that you submitted with us that a common barrier is um, just not even the inclusion on your formularies on on many organizations formularies. And so we did have a webinar to um, to support you know overcoming that barrier last year, um, which I of course encourage everyone to go watch. And then um, the second question along the same lines is um, if we are focused on diabetes and we're focused on cardiovascular disease, why are we being asked about kidney health screening procedures? And this is because uh, patients with type 2 diabetes and kidney disease are three times more likely to die from a cardiovascular event. So we recognize that um, early detection and use of medications designed to protect the heart and kidneys can really help to prevent these events. And we want to see um, how our organizations are performing on these um, different uh, screenings uh, on an annual basis, see how often they're being performed, which are being performed. And so we wanted to learn more about that and are including those questions on our um, attestation questions section, which is called the clinical practice questions. Um, I'll also note we do have another new resource here as well. There's a um, kidney health screening guide on the target type 2 diabetes website. So that might be something you're interested in if you are having questions around um, kidney health screenings and, and why they're being included on, um, on this program form. And I think that wraps up our, our common questions. Have we gotten any new questions in the chat? We have not gotten any new questions in our chat or our Q&A at this point. Which just means you must have been very clear <laughs> in, in your delivery. But thank you. Hey, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe give um, one more opportunity, a uh, few things, if you have any questions, you know, on our, on our, platform tools or resources, or we've got Allison Smith here for all the deep dives into target BP. Um, yeah, I'll just um, reiterate that, you know, this, we had an opening kickoff webinar in January, another deeper dive into the attestation uh, questions and office hours. So those recordings from the events that have happened so far this year are available 
as well as the recording from the one today will be available shortly. So um, hopefully you can take advantage of, of those events as well as all the uh, documents that have been dropped in the, the chat today. Any other comments or questions? Well, I'll just say that we are so grateful for your interest in all of uh, these award achievement programs to demonstrate your commitment to the condition, improving the care and outcomes of these conditions. Um, thank you. It's such a, an important effort uh, annually, and uh, we thank you for, for participating. Anything else, Liz, that you want to I'll just add, add my... That? Thanks. I know we're kind of, uh, we're about halfway through the data submission cycle. So there's still a little bit of time uh, left to, to work through the details. Uh, and I just want to um, plug our contact us form one more time because this really helps us connect you with uh, a, a local representative who's able to provide one on one support. So if you have questions that are a little bit uh, that you might feel are too in the weeds to share right now. Um, we certainly are happy to like continue to provide support and, and work through those together with you. But overall, just thank you so much for, for joining today. We'll have one more office hours on May 1st. So if you um, have uh, you know those last, last minute burning questions and you wanna talk with this group, um, we welcome you to join us again here in um, a little over a month. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. We'll just stick around for a second in case there are any straggler questions. Thank you. <laughs>